Well, uh, so we pick up right here where we left off this morning, but this is not this evening from this morning. Uh, for some reason, it didn't record, so I'm up here on the, my off day, as it were, and I'm going to go through this, uh, though I'm here by myself. And so those of you who want to watch the entire study of Daniel won't miss part two. So we'll pick up where we left off Sunday morning. So when we have uh, the book of Daniel, you have to understand the context of what it is. And remember, the context, you have to know who wrote it and why. In this case, Daniel wrote it, but God actually wrote it. He told Daniel, so why did God choose Daniel to write it? Who wrote it and why? Why did God choose Daniel? You have to understand that. Secondly, uh, just briefly, you have to know to whom was Daniel writing it. And of course, Daniel was writing it for everybody in the future, including us, that would read it. But specifically, he was uh, writing it to those Jews who were in captivity that would shortly be going back to Israel. So a specific group and then a general group. But uh, specifically, he was writing to the Jews that were in captivity. Third thing you have to ask yourself is, when the Jews read what Daniel wrote, what did they think? Not what do we think in 2018, what did the Jews back then think of Daniel? Of course, they would think something immediately upon reading it. Then they would also think something more about it as things unfolded. Okay? And uh, as, let's, let's say somebody completely denied, didn't accept what Daniel said. But as they then see Daniel's uh, prophecies coming uh, fulfilled, being full, coming true, uh, being fulfilled, they would change their mind, per se. That's just one illustration. What if they totally accepted Daniel, what he said. How much more would they think, or how differently would they think as they see things coming, coming to pass? <clears throat> so, who wrote it and why? To whom did he write it and why? When the people to whom he wrote it read it, what did they think at that time and following? And then uh, you have to ask yourself, uh, what is the social, uh, political, uh, economic, uh, spiritual context of the society of that time. You need to know that. Okay? When you have those things done, who wrote it, who did they write it to, what did they think, uh, and so forth, you have a context. Then you can ask yourself the fifth and most important question, and that is, how, how does that apply to me? How can I learn from it? If I don't know what the context is, I can't really apply any of it to myself with any kind of assurance because a text, what's written, without the context is just pretext. I have an idea, an opinion about Daniel. I don't know why or what or who or when. So I read it, <coughs> excuse me, and therefore my conclusion at the end is what I started with because I don't know the context. So I have need the context. So then we talked about that. So now we get into the Greek rule. Now the Greek rule of that area of the world, Persia, happens after Daniel, about 200 years after Daniel. Now this all comes into play, and we'll get into it into the chapters later on, how the people who lived after Daniel, the, the, the Magi, uh, they were uh, influenced by Daniel greatly. We'll talk about that when we get to it. But so 200 years later, there's still a lot of Daniel's influence on the uh, political world. But the Greek rule starts with Alexander the Great. He brought an end to the Persians at the Battle of uh, Arbella in 331 BC. When uh, Alexander dies, his uh, empire, the, the Grecian Empire, is split into four parts. The Ptolemy family takes over Egypt. Uh, uh, Cassandra takes over Macedonia, Persia, Babylon area, Middle East, Iraq, Iran, we'd say today. Uh, our, uh, Cassandra, I should say, Macedonia. Uh, Seleucus, he takes over the Babylonian part. And uh, Lysimachus, he takes over Asia Minor, what today we would say is uh, Eastern Turkey in that kind of an area, okay? Where Crimea is and that kind of a thing. And when we read these names, Ptolemy, Cassandra, Seleucus, and Lysimachus, don't think of them as one person. Think of them as the family. It was the dad the general with that name at the time, and then his son, grandson, so forth. And so like when we get to Egypt, we'll talk about Ptolemy. He, it's not the original Ptolemy. It's Ptolemy the second, third, fourth, fifth kind of a thing. All right? So Ptolemy in Egypt, the Ptolemy family in Egypt, they captured Jerusalem in 320 B.C., and then they go down and they start ruling in Egypt, and they rule for a long time, from 320 
to 198 BC. Uh, between 285 and 270, over a 15 year period or so, uh, Ptolemy Philadelphus, who is kind of a literary buff, he has collected all kinds of, of writings from all over the world, all over that central area of the world, you know, the, the Alexandrian Empire, and he brings them to Alexandria, Egypt, and has them translated from their original languages into Greek. And one of the things that he had translated was the Old Testament. Now, we call it the Old Testament, but the, the Jewish people don't call it the Old Testament. It's the Tanakh. So they, he had the Tanakh translated into Greek. And he had some Greek scholars, some linguists there, and he had some Hebrew religious guys who were linguists there. And so when it was translated from Hebrew into Greek, he made sure that everything was translated correctly. So how do you know? Well, when you get to the time of Christ, uh, Jesus, the disciples, uh, John, uh, the Baptist, uh, Paul, the apostle, when they quote the old, what we call the Old Testament, when they quote Tanakh scriptures, nine times out of ten, they quote the Septuagint. Every now and then, they will quote from the Tanakh. And you can tell the difference when you're reading it. You'll see two passages quoting the same Old Testament scripture, and they're not the same. Well, one's translated from the Hebrew, one's translated from the Greek. I mention that because we see then that Jesus puts his approval on the Greek translation as being correct. Because he quotes from it in, uh, repeatedly, more times than he does from the, from the Hebrew. Well, anyway, that's Ptolemy's in Egypt. They, they, there's more history. You can go look all that up if you want. Uh, Seleucus in Persia, in the Babylonian Persia, Iraq, Iran kind of area. Uh, Antiochus the Fourth Epiphanes, uh, in, uh, he, he reigned that area from 175 to 163, and he outlawed Judaism. And on December the 5th, 25th, I should say, December the 25th, uh, 169 B.C., in Jerusalem, he set up an idol in the Holy of Holies. He went into the temple and set up the, an idol. He just, and it messed it all up. And that was referred to as the abomination that, the, 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 of desolation. The abomination that makes desolate, that Daniel spoke of. So it's already there, and it's about, give or take a nickel, about 150 years before Christ. When the apostles come to Christ and they ask him a question, we won't get into it in depth right now, he says, when you see the abomination that makes desolate spoken of by Daniel, well, how can they see it if it happened 150 years ago? Jesus said, it's going to happen again. When you see it, and it's going to happen again. All right? So we'll talk about that when we get there. So uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, he makes uh, the first fulfillment of the passage in Daniel, chapter 11, verse 31. Okay? So there we have just a brief map. You can see Cassandra and Lysimachus and Seleucus and Ptolemy, where, they, uh, where their empires were. And all of that at one time was the Persian Empire. Or the, the, uh, so I'm sorry, I'm saying that backwards. At, at one time it was the Alexandrian Empire. The Alexandrian Empire and the yellow part there was, the, was basically the Persian Empire. After the Greeks are, def, are taken over by the Roman Empire... The uh, Magi the, of, of the Median Babylonian Persian hierarchy down in Babylon, they all high foot north and they go to a place up north that becomes eventually becomes Parthia. And the Parthian Empire and the Roman Empire for years fight over who's going to control Palestine. And we'll talk about that at some other time. But uh, that takes place. So there's the, your maps of Babylon and then Persia, and then Greece, you can, you can compare them. And if you ever want any of the notes from all of this, you can contact me at David J. Vanneman uh, at Juno.com. Give me your address or whatever, and I'll send you a copy. Then the Romans came on. Now, this is way past Daniel, but it goes into New Testament time, so we're going to cover this just quickly. Uh, won't do all the stuff. Uh, Rome was founded by Romulus in, in 753 B.C., now, it's not the Roman Empire that you're thinking of, you know, the gladiators and all that. It was founded as a city-state. And the uh, most of, if not, uh, I'll, 
I won't say all, but almost all, uh, most of the inhabitants of the original Rome were related to the Greeks. They, they were a uh, clan of the Greek uh, world. The Etruscans, they, they moved over and they founded Rome. And Rome was actually, you know, we laid the building stone for the first big uh, thing, we'll call it Rome. It's our own city-state, our own power. But they were uh, a, really a, not a big power, not a big state, but they were founded. Daniel was still alive when they were founded, but they weren't a big world power at the time. They don't become a world power until much later on. Uh, Pompeius in 63 B.C., he captures Jerusalem. So you see there, you know, 400 years have gone by and uh, when Rome is now powerful enough to capture Jerusalem. And he annexes Palestine to Rome. And uh, before that, it was never called Palestine, but because of a lot of political events, Rome got tired of the Jews not doing what they were supposed to do, so they came in and really spanked them hard. And they said, from now on, we're not going to call you Judea. We're going to call you Palestine. And Palestine is a derivation of what they really called them. And what they really called them was Palestina, which was the Roman version of Philistine, because the Jews and the Philistines had had conflict for so long Rome said, we're not even going to recognize you. So it would be like uh, coming to the United States, as it were, and saying, well, from now on, you're not the United States. We're going to call you, uh, oh, whatever, Canada or Mexico or whatever. We're not having a problem with them, but like, but we're, we're not going to call you uh, United States of America. We're going to just call you uh, North America. We're going to call you Canada Junior or something like that. So it was that kind of thing. So, they, so the Romans put the name Palestine on Judea so as not to recognize their Jewish uh, problem and they put they put the Jews under and called them by the name of one of their enemies Palestine okay then in 49 through 8 BC Julius Caesar defeated Pompey and so on and then in 47 BC Julius Caesar invades Egypt and takes Cleopatra to be the queen uh, and she's actually not Egyptian she's a she's a Macedonian uh, lady uh, in uh, 36 B.C., Octavius defeats Sextus Pompey, and he appoints, uh, appoints the, the Senate and to be, he has the Senate appoint him to be tribune for life. I, I, as long as I live, I get to be the king, okay? Uh, Julius Caesar then sets up, or it's, not, it's actually, it, Julius is gone, but the, they set up a religious worship of Julius Caesar as God as being one of the gods. And so we have the official uh, Roman teaching now that the, the, the emperor, the Caesar, is divine. And that started in 42 B.C. and it carries on for a long time, caused lots of problems. 32 B.C., Marcus Antonius divorces his wife Octavia. He marries Cleopatra, who's down in Egypt. Okay, Octavius defeats the Marcellus in 31 B.C. at the Battle of Actium. And then in 27 B.C., Octavius appoints himself as the Augustus, the, the head cheese, the big dude, the, the number one fella, Caesar Augustus, where we get our month August from. But Caesar Augustus is the one that we hear about in the Bible, okay? Uh, when Mary and Joseph go to, to uh, uh, leave Galilee and go down to Bethlehem because of what Caesar Augustus was doing. Caesar Augustus in 12 B.C., he is given the title Pontificus Maximus, the guy who conquers death. Outside the city of Rome is a Tiber River. And uh, when you become Caesar, they make a pontoon boat bridge and you walk across the Tiber River, sig being si significating. That's not the right word. But it signifies that you, as Caesar, and you're divine, you beat death. The river Styx goes around death. Um, and so this pontoon boat bridge is what you walk across to show that you have conquered death. You're the magnificent one, you're the top dog, the Maximus, who has walked across the pontoon bridge, the pontifex. You, you, you don't uh, have to answer to death. Of course, they all die, so how's that work? Augustus dies and Tiberius becomes the emperor, appoints Sergianus the chief of the Praetorian Guard. Tiberius is murdered and Caliglia uh, takes over. Caliglia was assassinated and Claudius became emperor great show on pbs years ago i claudius is really good if you ever get a copy you ought to watch it it's pretty good, pretty decent history of it uh comes out of the 12 caesars uh history books and so forth uh claudius is then assassinated by agrippina and is succeeded by nero who fiddles while rome burns there's more to that story than you get but then in 68 galba is pronounced the new emperor okay in 69 galba is murdered 
so forth. And in 70, and that's why we're talking about this, because in 70, what happens is Vitellius runs back to Rome because Caesar died, and he's supposed to be the next Caesar, so he's going to go back to Rome to take care of Vespasian, I should say. Vitellius is defeated. Vespasian is supposed to be the next Caesar. So Vespasian runs back home, and in Israel, in Judea, in Palestina, he leaves his son Titus in charge. So while Vespasian is becoming, uh, you know, inaugurated as so, uh, so forth, uh, becoming Caesar, Titus says, hey, you, you Jewish people, you're driving me nuts. So he levels the city of Jerusalem and destroys the temple, tears it all down, actually sets it on fire and melts the gold all out of it. And it's never been put back yet. Okay? So... Uh, that was Titus in 70. Then, of course, it goes on. We're now into the ADs, not in the, in the BCs. Constantine in 323 makes Christianity legal. In 380, Theodosius I makes it the official state religion. And uh, then in 395, Theodosius divides the Roman Empire from the, between the East and the Western empires. Later on, the Western Empire falls, falls apart. And we usually think, oh, Rome fell. But the eastern leg of it was around for another thousand years. Okay? And so when you get into Daniel's prophecies, and it's talking about the reconstruction of the ten toads and all that kind of stuff, it's not necessarily talking about it, it, it can include, but it's not exclusively European because Rome had two legs. Okay? That comes into play. All right. So then you have a chart here, and uh, you have... All of the Caesars and the early church era, going from Julius Caesar in 49 B.C. down to Trajan uh, in 117 A.D. Okay? You see a little history so you know the context of what's going on. And Daniel didn't live that whole time, but Daniel talked about the time in which he lived and many events that were going to come true in the future. So a lot of times we look at the Bible and we say between Malachi and Matthew, there's 400 silent years. Well, they're not silent if you read Daniel chapter 11 and 12. Daniel 11 and 12 talks extensively about them, about who's going to marry who and who's going to attack who and who's going to get killed and who's going to live and what's going to happen and all that kind of stuff. So that 400 years is very, very much covered in advance. Okay? So then we have the Roman Empire. There's just a map there of the Roman Empire. And then we have now the literary context of Daniel. It's important for us to understand that Daniel is not written chronologically. It's written in two different parts, and I'll talk about that in just a second here, okay? So there's your four maps to give you a little bit of review. The Babylons, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, moving on, the panoramic view of history, and we're right there where the little hourglass is. We're in the exile, okay? And I won't spend any time on that. You can take a look at that later. First, we have to know Daniel is an eyewitness. The accounts that he gives about what's going on could only be given if you were standing there looking at it. Recent archaeological finds have shown that what Daniel says was there, was there. Daniel's very detailed in the colors used, in the places where they were, and that kind of stuff. Daniel then records in advance, he prophesies, I just mentioned in Daniel chapter 11 and 12 especially, the future of Gentile history. The accuracy of it then gives us as far as I'm concerned, the proof that he's not the guy. He didn't make this up. This is not of human origin. This is of a divine origin. It contains, then, the key to eschatology. We want to know what's going to happen in the future. You want to know what's happening in the last times. Know what Daniel's talking about. When the apostles came to Jesus, they said, what about the future and so forth? And he said, have you not read Daniel? And he quotes what it, to us would be Daniel chapter 9, verses 20 through 26, somewhere in there, 27, uh, 20, 20 to 27, something like that. And he says, do you not understand that? That, that? No Daniel. It'll tell you about the kingdom and all that kind of a thing. We'll get into that a little bit later. Daniel's most historically validated book in the Bible. The country, the nation of Greece is mentioned by name 150 years before it even existed. Uh, when... Uh, Jadua, the high priest of Jerusalem, was uh, Alexander's army was coming to capture Jerusalem. He goes out and, and meets, meets uh, Daniel. He says, look here, 
a long time ago, Daniel wrote and mentioned you by name. 400 years ago, 300 years ago, whatever it was. I can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, 332 B.C. There, it's right there on the thing. In 332 B.C., he said, here it is. Okay, and Daniel lived uh, about 200, years before that. And when Alexander's general showed, showed the writings to Alexander, Alexander said, leave Jerusalem alone. Don't destroy it. They've got a prophet there that mentioned Greece by name. In uh, Kediway's excavation, it, this was t- taken place out in uh, uh, the Middle East, Iraq, Iran area, all over, but then especially in where uh, Babylon was. And this was in the late 1800s, early 1900s. He found the remnants of uh, Nebuchadnezzar's temple. And it's interesting to know that Babylon, the area, the city area within the city limits of Babylon, has never been totally abandoned. There have been people living there all along. The big, huge city's not there. The Bible says it's going to come back. The big, huge city is going to come back, it says. But right now, it's you'll go out there, it's kind of a deserty wasteland, but there's still buildings there, and there's still people living there. Okay? And the Bible prophesies about that, too. We'll get to that later. Daniel is quoted by Jesus three times. Jesus calls Daniel, Daniel the prophet. Ezekiel quotes Daniel three times. One of the two men in scripture of whom nothing bad is said. It doesn't mean they were perfect and they never did anything bad. The Bible just never records that Daniel did anything wrong. Okay? Uh, he's one of two people. The other person, you, you figure it out. It's, it's easy, but I won't tell you. There are 15 Persian words and three Greek words found in Daniel that are nowhere else in the Bible. That's because Daniel uh, was trilingual. Uh, he spoke to uh, the, the Nebuchadnezzar. He, he was, uh, when he first went to uh, Babylon, he was in his young teens, 12 to 18 years of age, somewhere in there. He spoke Jewish, Hebrew. And uh, he went over and he became a person in the court of Nebuchadnezzar. So he had to speak Babylonian. Uh, later on, when Cyrus the, the Mede took over and Alexander came through and all that kind of stuff, Greece was in power in a lot of areas, and to do business you had to know Greek. And so he uses three languages in his book, and it doesn't surprise me at all. But it's a very, very interesting book. Now, as I said, it's not all uh, just... If you just read Daniel, that's fine, and you'll get all the truth out of it that there is, but if you understand how it's written, it will help. Daniel chapter 1 is in Hebrew. Daniel chapter 2 through 7 are in Aramaic. Daniel chapter 8 through 12 are in Hebrew. The portions that are in Hebrew are all about Jews for the most part and what affects them directly. The parts in Aramaic are all about the current Gentile world. And uh, chapter 4 is actually written by Nebuchadnezzar himself. And God has Nebuchadnezzar write chapter 4. Of course then, uh, by some process, Daniel writes it down, but he writes down what Nebuchadnezzar says. So it's written by Daniel physically in handwriting, but it's Nebuchadnezzar, it starts out with, I, Nebuchadnezzar, this is what I'm saying. And he closes, and so I, Nebuchadnezzar the king, I have said. And uh, so it was written either directly by Nebuchadnezzar or dictated by him, but God had Nebuchadnezzar give us his testimony in chapter 4. We'll get to that when we get to chapter 4. So, chapters 2 through 7 are in Aramaic, and they're centered on the Gentile world. Chapters 1 and then 8 through 12 are in Hebrew, and they're centered around Israel and things that directly affect them the most. Daniel has some visions, okay? And so when we look at those, uh, we'll see them. And here, this list is of the parts that are in Hebrew. They're in, in the red, if you see them there. And uh, we've covered that. Chapter 1 and then 8 through 12 are in Hebrew. All right? And uh, I won't go through all of the details of all that stuff. We'll do it when we get to each chapter later on. Now, I said they're not chronological. The first couple of chapters are about history. This is what's going on. The last chapters are about prophecies and visions. But some of the prophecies and visions actually took place earlier. There's they're just compartmentalized later. So you'll see that chapter 7 and 8, the four beasts vision and the vision of the ram and the he-goat, they actually happen in the middle of chapter 4. But they're placed after the histories are done. And so they're not 
they're not written in the book chronologically, but if you know where to put them. So it goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 7, 8, 5, 9, 6, 10 through 12. It's the actual order that they occurred. But the visions are about the future, so they happen after the history. Okay, So that'll help you understand, again, who wrote it and why. When the guy that wrote it, to whom did he write it and why did he write it to them? When the people that read it, read it what did they think? How did they understand it? Okay. Fourth thing, what are the contexts of it? How, how does it all go together? Does it agree with everything else? And then I can say, how does it apply to me? All right. So back to some history. In 722, Israel, the northern half of uh, the Jewish nation, when they rebelled, there was, there was now Israel to the north and Judah to the south. And Israel is sometimes referring to the northern kingdom. Judah is sometimes referring to the southern kingdom. Sometimes Israel is referring to both of them. Sometimes Judah is referring to both of them. So you have to read what the whole paragraph says to understand what Israel and what Judah mean in that specific sentence. Okay? But uh, the northern kingdom of Israel fell to tiglath pileser and the Assyrians back in 722. In 612, Nineveh was taken by Babylon and the Median uh, uh, Empire. Uh, in 609, Pharaoh Necho comes up against Assyria. Josiah, the king of, of Judah, fights against him and is killed. You can read about that in 2 Chronicles. In 606 is the Battle of Carchemish, where Nebuchadnezzar defeats Necho, and Babylon becomes now the true power. They've beaten Assyria, uh, and they've beaten uh, Egypt, and so now they're the big kid on the block. Okay, So the official start of we are the ones in charge, this is in 606 B.C. Now, in that they have conquered everybody, they move south into Canaan, and they're going to conquer everybody between Assyria and Egypt, which is basically everybody in Palestine. So according to history, and you can see this in the Jewish Bibles, the Hebrew Bibles, there are four different deportations. The first one in 605, third year of Jehoiakim, that's when Daniel's taken. The second deportation was in 597 B.C. Uh, that's when Jeconiah is the king. And uh, the, the blood curse that God puts on Jeconiah and his sense that nobody in the family of Jeconiah will ever be king again is a big deal. It comes into play with Joseph, you know, Joseph and Mary at Christmas time. Joseph is in that bloodline. Therefore, Joseph cannot be the king, nor can any of his blood descendants be the king. Ergo, Jesus, virgin born, not the son of Joseph, can be, but none of Mary and Joseph's kids can be. Whole other thing we can talk about at a different time. Uh, that's a blood curse put on Jeconiah. It involves the law of Zelophehad and the laws of liverite marriage. And uh, I talk about that at Christmas. So if you want to go back and look at some of the Christmas uh, messages, you can do that. The third deportation takes place in 587 B.C. Uh, that's when uh, Zedekiah is put in as the tribute king. And that's in Nebuchadnezzar's 18th year. Then the fourth deportation, the last one, happens in 582 B.C., in Nebuchadnezzar's 23rd year. And it's at that point that they just, you know, they're tired of it and they, they just take everybody and all that. The people that they leave are the lesser quality folks, shall we say. I don't know how you want to put it. They were the unskilled. Babylon did not want to take slaves back. They didn't have any ability, any skill. So they left the knuckle-dragon, gill-breathing lowlifes. They tended to, then, to survive and to make it through. They intermingled with whoever else was left in the area. The ending result, long story short, is the Samaritans. And so when the Jews in Babylon, who have maintained their blood purity, as it were, when they finally come back with Ezra and Nehemiah, and they set up the, the temple and all that kind of stuff, and the Romans come in and all that kind of stuff, and then Jesus is born, and then Jesus has his, his earthly ministry here, the Bible in the New Testament talks about this, this headbutting problem between the Jews, us purebreds, and you Samaritans, you half-breeds. They hate each other. That's how that all comes into being with the people that uh, Babylon didn't take. There's more to say about all that, but not right now. Babylon's first siege in Jerusalem in 790, or 597 B.C. And we have then, at, that's, that starts a period of time that lasts for 70 years. And that time of, is referred to as the servitude of nations. And there's three 
time periods that involve the number 70 and the word years. And they're all different, and they mean different things, so I'm going to try to explain them. You have first the servitude of nations, which lasts for 70 years. And it starts with the first deportation. You are now enslaved in Babylon. That's going to last for 70 years. Second Chronicles talks about that. He says, God says, I told you to keep the Sabbath, and you haven't, and you owe me 70 sabbatical years. You didn't let, let the land rest on the sabbatical years like you were supposed to, and you skipped 70 of them, so you're going to go into captivity for 70 years until I get my time back. That's what God says. Okay? The second siege, when Jehoiakim refused to take Jeremiah's counsel, Jeremiah keeps saying, Jehoiakim, listen, do what the Babylonians say. God said this was supposed to happen because of this and that and the other, and uh, Jehoiakim won't, and so there's a battle. Jehoiakim dies, and there's a blood curse put on uh, Jeconiah and his bloodline and so forth. And 10,000 folks are taken uh, off to Babylon. Uh, Ezekiel is taken, and he goes down to uh, south of Babylon. And uh, talk about that when we get there. And uh, Jeremiah and Ezekiel warn against the rebellion, but nobody will listen to them. They're ignored, okay? Then the third siege takes place in 587. And in 587, Jeconiah ignores the warnings of Ezekiel and Jeremiah, doesn't do what they're told. And they're taken away, and that starts the desolation of Jerusalem. The desolation of Jerusalem is 70 years long. But it starts after the first one, and it will end after, because you've got 70 years here and 70 years here. They're like that. They don't start and end at the same time. And the desolation of Jerusalem will end when Cyrus says, go back and rebuild the temple. Okay? So that's how they go there. And uh, so you have the servitude of nations and the desolation of Jerusalem. Servitude of nations starts with the first siege and ends when Ezra goes back to build the temple. The third uh, siege until going back to rebuild the city with Nehemiah, that's the desolation of Jerusalem. Okay? First siege to go back and rebuild the temple, that's servitude of nations. The third siege to go back and rebuild the city, that's the desolation of Jerusalem. They both last seven years. Or 70 years, I should say. All right? Also, then you have the 70 weeks of years that Daniel talks about in Daniel chapter 9. That starts after that. So don't get those confused. Three contemporaneous prophets were Daniel in Babylon, Ezekiel in Kibar, south of uh, Babylon, in a refugee camp kind of a situation. Uh, and Jeremiah, who was in Jerusalem, but eventually fled to Egypt. And uh, there's a, there are many people, I don't, I don't know if this is correct or not, but there are many people who think that when he went to Egypt, he took the Ark of the Covenant with him. Whether he did or not, I don't know. Uh, you can study that out and come up with your own conclusion. All right? Ezekiel chapter 12, verse 10 and following talks all about this. I'm not going to go through and read it all. But you can see this. And uh, Ezekiel says, hey, listen. King, if you don't do what you're supposed to do the way I'm telling you, you're going to end up in Babylon and you're going to die there, but you'll never see it. Well, he doesn't do what he's told. And uh, Zedekiah then, the last thing that he ever sees is the Babylonians strap him up against the, the tree, as it were, and butcher his children in front of him. That's last, and then they put his eyes out. Then they take him to Babylon. And he goes to Babylon and he dies there. So he, the last thing he saw was his kids getting hacked up. Then he left left Jerusalem, ended up in Babylon, and as, as he was told by, the, by Jeremiah, hey, you're going to be in Babylon, you're going to die there, but you'll never see it. He had his eyes put out. So you see that that was all fulfilled. See in Jeremiah 39, 7, moreover, they put his eyes out and carried him off to Babylon. All right? So here we have, again, you'll see in the yellow there, the servitude of the nations from the first siege to Cyrus and the desolation of Jerusalem from the third siege to Artaxerxes Alonjamanus when he says go back and rebuild the city. And that we'll talk about later on. And here you have a chart of the 69 weeks. Actually, there are 70 of them. We all get all done, but don't worry about the 70th one. That's different. Uh, the 69 weeks of years. And that's from the commandment that Artaxerxes Longimanus wrote. For, uh, he gave the letter to Nehemiah. And he says, Nehemiah, go back and rebuild the city, the walls, the streets, all that kind of stuff. And uh, Gabriel told Daniel in Daniel chapter uh, 9, verse 25, I think it is, that uh, when that decree, that, that decree is signed, start counting the days. Uh, 730,880 sunrises and sunsets later, Messiah will ride into Jerusalem. 
and uh, we'll get to that. Or you can go back and look at the Christmas messages I gave, and I explain all that. And so you have that chart. And so then we leave off here, and uh, later on we'll pick up with Daniel chapter 1. Again, if you have any uh, questions that you want to ask, or if you'd like the copy of the notes, uh, just contact me. Uh, at davidjvanneman at juno.com. Leave me your address and I'll mail you some, uh, free of charge. Thank you very much.